Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Roger Derling. I'm the executive director of the Santa Barbara International Film Festival, and we have the great pleasure of having director Antonio Campos, and he's also the uh, co-writer. Um, the film is The Devil All the Time, and Joe Morgerstern from the Wall Street Journal raved, saying Mr. Campos and his superb cast com confer such authority in the whole thing that there's no choice but to follow the film's three time-hopping intertwined stories. So welcome, Antonio. Um, yeah, incredible. He's, he's in Chile, everybody. So he's joining us all the way from Chile. And um, I want to start by asking you about the, the narration, which before we started, I was mentioning it's one of the, it's, it's one of the delicious things about the film. The narration is unlike anything we've seen. Um, is, um, it actually becomes almost like a musical, uh, like, a, like, like it, it fits like a music, like, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. like a soundtrack. Can you tell us about how you arrived to the decision of using the narration? Well, it's funny that you said that about music because I haven't heard that, but but I've I've talked about it. Um, the the narration when when we were talking to the composers, I would tell the composers like think about the the voiceover as another instrument that you're playing mm. along with or playing against, but think about it as an instrument that you have to respond to in some way or take into consideration because his voice has a musicality and it is a another kind of um, you know, it, it's it, what he's doing over a scene isn't just um, information. It, there's a there's a rhythm, there's a tone, there's a there's a musicality to it. Um, and he and, also, and we talked about this earlier. And he not only narrates; he's almost like another character because yeah. he co he comments. And I mentioned to you that it's rare for me to be listened to a narrator that seems to be having fun yeah. um, telling the story. Yeah, and that was the idea when when we conceived of it was that the narrator would be kind of another character, and we always thought of the narrator. We always imagined the narrator would be Don Pollock, the author of the novel, whose voice we knew very well, and whose voice also added a sort of layer of authenticity over the whole thing because Don Pollock, who created the world and who um, obviously knows it inside out is from this place called Knock'em Stiff, this little holler in the middle of Southern Ohio. And he was born and raised there and he, he lived just outside of there his entire life. And so th there's just a kind of history and um, you know weight to his voice that you, we couldn't replicate. Um, and that's what we wanted to try and capture. So was it, was it difficult to convince him to? No. It wasn't, it was very, I, I was very worried that it would be a lot harder to convince him. Um, and I waited a long time and then I finally got the courage after I think a year and a half of knowing him to say, you know, Don, I think you'd be, you know, I'd, I'd really like to see you um, do the narration in the movie. And he, and he immediately said yes and said, you know, if you don't like it, you can, you can, you can tell me and find somebody else. And I said, I think, I think you're gonna do just fine. I want to latch on to something that you mentioned earlier and when we were talking about the the music and the narration as a as sort of uh, music, um, you use the word instrument and um, you also use a soundtrack of songs and I, I love the usage for two reasons. Is one that we're able to tell the passage of time with the songs, but also yes. the songs become like an ironic commentary to what we're seeing visually. Can you can you talk about that? Um, well, yeah. I mean, that that, that was the, the the two things you just identified were were very key to the music we chose. Um, the the use of because you know you need to sort of indicate to the audience without spelling out that you're in a different, you know, uh, telegraphing that you're in a different time. So music was a very um, simple device to do that. And, and then, you know, the film, the film presents a lot of really kind of violent and um, 
and, and, and challenging scenarios, right? So music as a counterpoint was something that we leaned into to kind of, um, to kind of soften the blow, you know, um, to, to add some humor wherever it felt appropriate. Um, and, uh, and so my music, my music supervisor on this is the producer, the pro Randy Poster, who's Randy very well known as a, as a music supervisor. But he's the one that brought me the book about eight years ago, who said, I think you'd like this. And if you like it, I, I'd like to make this with you. And so he, he was a fantastic producer, but you know, his area of expertise outside of sort of producing was with music. So from the moment that we started writing the script, even before I started writing the script, I had these amazing playlists to, to listen to. You have, um, it's, it's a sprawling saga and you have so many characters. And even at the beginning, we see them for a brief, a brief period, but they're so fleshed out. And it's eventually that we understand that they're, they're not just supporting characters. How, yeah. how challenging was it to, uh, you know, to create that, that dynamic? Well, from the from the from the, um, the 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 conception or the the design of the script, it was it was, you know, characters will be supporting characters in one storyline, but then they'll be the 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 lead character, or the main character in their own storyline, and then the people that were leads will be supporting characters, and so this was a game that we were kind of playing from from the you know from from the, the screenplay. And it was, it was the way that the film could work because you need to um, set up, you need to set everybody up in the first 10 minutes or so, so that the audience has a, a taste of who's in the world. And, and part of the, the, the thinking behind the casting was you need people who have either memorable faces or familiar faces so that the audience consciously or subconsciously is like, oh, that's that person and they're, they're somebody I know, so they must be important, you know? Or like they look very strange and I will not forget that face. And so when they come back, you aren't thrown out of the thing, but you're just sort of like, oh, right, that person, and you kind of go with it. So um, the, the, you know, it was it was something that, conceptually we had in the script and we, we felt like would work. And then in the casting, we really kind of, I think, figured out how to make it so that this device, this idea would work. In the, in the film, the through line is the father-son relationship, which yeah. is Willard in the first half of the film. And then you have Arvin in the and the you know you have the father son that brings yes. that brings it all together is that something that was in the novel that that you have that you know maybe the you know bigger characters being willard yeah. arvin that was that was the, the 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 thing of about the novel that i really loved was that that it was this very sprawling um tangential story with a lot of characters but the spine of it was this father-son um, story and the story of what the father has passed on to the son and what the son will do with that and how he how his life is affected by the choices his father made mm -hmm. so that was always that was in the book and that was one of the, that was the thing that we were like okay well this this is what we can hold this is the thing that is the spine of the movie um and now we have to figure out how to embrace this kind of multi-strand narrative quality of the novel as well. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, you talked about earlier about it being set in Ohio and this film obviously has a very southern gothic feel and, and tradition but we're not, we've never, <laughs> we're not in the south, we're in the oh. midwest. Yes. Um, was, it, was that something that how you know how was it for you to be handling this southern gothic novel but in in ohio of all well, places well that's what i loved about the book was that the book 
was creating it's to me what felt like a subgenre, which was Midwestern Gothic. And I thought of it as a Midwestern Gothic. And I think it was more accessible to me as a filmmaker uh, approaching the material because it was that. Southern Gothic is one of my favorite genres. Flannery O'Connor is one of my favorite writers. Mm -hmm. But this book was a combination of like Flannery O'Connor and a, another one of my favorite, favorite writers, Jim Thompson, this hard boiled crime fiction writer. And so, um, I never felt like I was just telling a Southern Gothic tale. I felt like we were telling something that was very unique, which was this Midwestern Gothic story. And because Southern Ohio and West Virginia are very specific places, but they are, and, and they, they sound like the South, and people's accents sound like they're from the South, they are not quite the South. They're still considered Midwest. So it's an interesting part of the country um, with its very specific feel. And I'm from New York City. I don't have any sort of like direct links to Southern Ohio or West Virginia. I'm just fascinated by places that I, I'm not from. Um, that's kind of been a consistent thing with all my movies. They've all kind of taken place in a world that is far from where I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm drawn to the characters and I'm drawn to the, the, the world that they exist in. And so um, I, I really, what I, I was kind of leaning on the book and the, 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 the writing is so rich and detailed. It painted such a complete picture for me. But I also had Don Pollock, the author, as a resource himself. And I had him to guide me through Knock 'em Stiff. And I had him to show me through Chillicothe, which is the town that Mead is based on. So I, I had my in, you know what I mean? I had a way right. of kind of, I had a, a guide through this world um, to, to sort of make it, make the sound and the feel of the place um, alive for me. So that's, you, that was my way in, you know, and, and how it brought, I came, you know, felt personal to me or close to me. You, you earlier, we talked about how sprawling and massive this novel is and the book um, as well, um, but it has a very intimate feel to it. Um, can, you, can you talk about that? The fact that there's an intimacy about the way you approach the story? Um, I mean, I think it's just that, that I, when I'm, uh, uh, doing any scene, I'm focused on um, um, the character. And so uh, my filmmaking or my interest in the scene is usually sort of being intimate with the characters. Um, even if it's a wide shot, I, I still somehow feel like it should feel intimate some, somehow. Um, I always have this, I always say it's like this, it's hard for me to shoot um, images without a character in it. I have a hard time with just kind of like um, pretty images of places. Um, I always kind of need someone to hold on to. So I really love wide shots that are like big, wonderful vistas. And then there's a character this big, you know, mm -hmm. like I can, I can hold on, I can, that's what I connect to. I never really connect to beautiful kind of landscapes and things, but it's like, I connect to that landscape with this character as my subject, you know? And, um, and so I guess um, I'm always interested in kind of uh, um, trying to find, yeah, the character within even a um, grand image landscape. So I guess that's why the film even though it's sprawling, still has a, a very strong, intimate quality. Yeah, Antonio, I feel like I'm taking you away from a birthday party, a little mm. kid's birthday party oh, in the I'm background. Sorry. Let me hold on. Let no, me no, no worries. It's actually. It is. It is. I'm in Chile. This is. Um, it's not my son's birthday, but my son. We're celebrating my son's birthday today. Oh my goodness. Uh, He's <laughs> It's it's, it's delightful. It's actually. I just. I just. I hope that we're not taking <laughs> exactly. you. Away. 
no, no, no. But it's the exact opposite soundtrack to uh, to to the movie. You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> just this like lovely family feel in the background. Um, you know, the film has two parts, but they're unified. When you were shooting it, uh, was that was that fun? Uh, keeping in mind that the two of them. Um, did you did you shoot them as two separate parts or are you always with the unified uh, as a whole no we we there was i never thought I mean, it was always just one piece in order for this film to work there had to be a consistency or continuity to the entire thing so um i never thought of it as two parts i mean i thought of it like this is Roy's section, or this is Willard's section, and this is Carl and Sandy's section, or whatever. But um, I never thought of the beginning and, and the second, you know, first half or the second half. But I but did I, notice, Antonio, that there is a palette change. You know, there's a, a color, a yes. color change. Yes, is, yes. Like the first half. I mean, I'm not, I'm not well versed in in painters, but like the first half looked like an Andrew Wyatt painting, and then yes. the second half has a different feel, a different look. Yeah, that's exactly the the first half was was very much the first half of the movie, the '40s and '50s is very much inspired by the, the palette of an Andrew Wyeth painting. And the second half, which gets us into the 60s, is very much uh, inspired by um, William Eggleston photography. Mm -hmm. So it has a kind of, so all of a sudden you start seeing colors that don't feel like they're from the natural world, you know what I mean? Whereas Wyeth is very sort of earthy tones. So you start getting a lot of pastels, and and uh, patterns in the second half that you would not have in the and sort of like you know um you you start having things like um you know sandy's uh leopard skin coat which is totally fake you know like yeah. that, those kind of things would never exist in the first part of the movie um, and the reverend uh robert patterson yes and his kind of powder blue uh frilly outfit you know that 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 is a whole different color that's it, a color that has, doesn't exist at all in the first part of the movie. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, I know that your wife, Sophia, was the editor. Um, what was that process like uh, editing this big, sprawling uh, film? So the, the room that, we're, that I'm in right now is the room where um, my wife and I edited the first cut of the movie. And this was like where all these posters were was just uh, hundreds of little uh, photographs uh, of each shot in the movie. Um, it was, you know, this movie is a very challenging movie to edit. There's, there's so many moving parts. It's just kind of keeping a lot of plates spinning. Um, but my wife is, in, in just in general, is just loves puzzles and this movie was a puzzle. And, um, and so she just really enjoyed the, 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 the constant sort of puzzle solving of it all. But, but um, no, I mean, working with family, I mean, I co-wrote this with, with my brother. Um, so, you know, um, I guess I embrace working with family, but it's, it's, it's not always easy, you know, to work mm -hmm. with your family. Um, you editing, edit, editing wise, you guys made a choice that um, we, we see something happen um, violent the, or that, it, that is about to happen. And then later on, we go back to, and we actually see the action. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is that something that came from the novel or is that something that you, you and your wife developed? Um, I think part of it is, is inspired by the book because the book is, is a really interesting book in that it Don doesn't um, he's not always explicit with uh, with his description of the violence, but he gives you just enough that you feel like you've seen the thing and your kind of mind starts to go places mm. and imagine it and um, and so I just have a tendency of shooting 
violence either kind of off screen or in a very direct matter of fact way um, generally. And so with this, we were interested in kind of giving scenes that gave the impression of something horrifying and then um, and then leaving and then sort of so, like solidifying or memorializing what happened with something that's very quick. You know, whether it's like the image, you only see the dog on the cross uh, briefly in the flashlight when the, when the sheriff comes, or you see the, the victim from the serial killers, Carl and Sandy, um, in that kind of quick flash um, that the narrator takes us to. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah and and um the the most horrifying scene is is actually us seeing the negatives um we don't actually see the photographs we see a negative of it and it is it is chilling to watch that montage of negatives um it yeah. it, it um how did you arrive about that that sequence I was just, I was just, when, when I got to the part in the book where the serial killer was interested in photog photographing his victims and the process of the, everything between him, his wife and, and the victims. Immediately, I just said, well, this is a, this is something that I can really kind of um, play with and I got really interested in the idea of showing this imagery negative because again, it, it gives you an impression. And I think that the impression is so much scarier than just the sort of, that's what it is. And I think what's so interesting is that the film is perceived as very violent and there is a lot of violence in the movie, but I do not think that the film is more violent than your typical um, action movie. And I think that the reason it feels so violent is because of the fact that your imagination does a lot of the work. And the film kind of leans into the banality of the, the violence and, and, and doesn't make it easy to digest. Like it's kind of like, it, it is what it is and it's shocking and you're killing people that you've gotten to know. So it has a, a very, um, you feel invested in the person that has done the act and the person that is the victim. Mm -hmm. um, you talk to us about the, 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 the aspect of religion. I, I don't think your film, you know, I don't want to speak for yourself, but you, this film is not condemning religion, but is, is, is condemning people that, that misinterpret religion or, yeah. or abuse religion. <laughs> Yeah, that the, the but that's 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 exactly what it is. I I wasn't making an anti-religion movie. Um, it was an anti-extremist, anti-fanatic, anti-fundamentalist movie. Um, it's a it's a film that's interested in and the story that Pollock laid out. You know, was about traumatized people. Um, weak people, devout people who um, who were who were who were looking for God to speak to them, praying for God to answer their prayers, to 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 guide them. And when God doesn't answer in that absence, they fill the void with their own think, their own thinking, their own thoughts, their own ideas. And that's where things get really dangerous. And so you have that. So the first half explores that. And then the second half explores these people like Tea Garden and Bodecker and and um, and uh, and Carl. And there's a different dynamic there. And that's a lot more about power and the abuse of power. Yeah. And, and geek, geeking out for a little second, but there is a very Bergman like quality to the film where you you see all these characters struggling with with their religion um has has bergman Ickman bergman played an influence to to your work 
Oh yeah. So the a big turning point in my life as a filmmaker was when I was um, 20 years old. I I had there was a my partners and I tried to make a feature film and it didn't happen. And the period of time right after you know I was dealing with that and kind of in, in a depression, there was an Ingmar Bergman retrospective. And I went to go see two Ingmar Bergman films a day for like a month. And it was the most therapeutic experience for me as a filmmaker. Cause I always felt, I also felt like I was going, I was suffering in my own depression, but I was like, well, it's nothing compared to everybody in that movie. You know what I mean? I felt like, well, compared to what B.B. Uh, Anderson's going through in this movie, I feel, <laughs> feel like I'm okay. But it was, it was kind of his, his exploration of faith and people struggling with faith and the way that he photographed that and he way, the way he photographed people praying and in a church, that was something that, that um, Lowell Crawley, the DP and I looked at a lot. Mm -hmm. Like uh, winter light was one that we looked at a lot. Um, speaking of religion, um, you know, tell us about working with Robert Pattinson. We've, it's an incredible performance and you know and tell us about how he developed that particular accent of his um the accent it's so funny so this accent is the people are so interested in this accent and the way that <laughs> rob developed this accent was um the we were very uh i i was very insistent on maintaining a consistency between the people that were from Southern Ohio and those that are from West Virginia. And that the sound of West Virginia was, was one thing and the sound of Southern Ohio was another thing. And even the sound of knocking stiff versus me was subtly different. And so we spent a lot of time uh, collecting references through Don Pollock, the author, uh, and people that he knew and he was helping us build a library of sounds and then um, this dialect coach that came through Tom Holland, his name is Rick Lipton, he's a fantastic dialect coach. And he was kind of overseeing everybody's accent. The one person that was so opposed to doing dialect coaching was Rob. And, and he, would, he would constantly find a reason to not make the meeting. And so we were always trying, I was like, why is Rob like, Rod texting Rob and trying to get him to do the meet. And he's like, oh yeah, man, yeah, no, no, I'll talk to him. Yeah, yeah. And they would always, then I get a text from the, the dialect coach and said, that, oh, I can't get Rob to, to do the meeting. And I would talk to Rob and we had, ta we had talked about some references, people from Tennessee and, and, um, and sort of preachers you see on television. And, um, but Rob was there, like Rob really um, is protective of his process. And he wanted to, you know, he was open to talking about what he was doing, but he didn't want to share the thing until he got the set. And so um, I didn't hear Rob's accent until the day I, I shot with him for the first time. I mean, I'd seen him in costume. We had obviously designed the wardrobe and all that stuff and the hair and everything, but his sound, the way he sounded, I didn't know until we, we got to set. And so um, for me, what Rob was doing was really interesting because it had a very specific feeling. I wasn't like, I wasn't being super picky about the fact that, oh, maybe this doesn't sound like Tennessee or this doesn't, I just felt like this sounds correct for whatever reason and close enough to what the references we heard that I just want to, I want him to just keep running with this and we'll kind of, uh, massage it and finesse it and and as the performance kind of as he gets more and more in character it would just kind of get tighter and tighter and um and and uh and so recently i guess like this week um gq did an article that i i randomly saw where they had a, a dialect coach analyze all the dialects in the movie everybody's accents and uh and he gave the film a top rating like a top mark and he said that rob did a very good job with the tennessee accent and so oh. i was very i was very proud because i felt like rob did something so unique that everybody is kind of like 
oh, what that accent, that accent. And I go, I mean, that accent is actually pretty close to what Tennessee sounds like, but it's such a specific character um, that it feels all its own. So, um, yeah. So you, so what if you didn't like what he was preparing? Because I mean, he, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, that's a funny question. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, that was my question. What if he, you didn't like what he was doing? He just took a big gamble. Yeah, but I, I have a lot of faith in the process of making movies. And I, and I had a lot, first, I had a lot of faith in Rob. And I knew whatever he did would be really interesting and cool. I knew it would be a strong choice, which I always like. I always like actors, good actors. I mean, I, I always try and work with really good actors. And when you work with really good actors and make strong choices and, and it's usually based on like some very good instincts and a lot of homework that they do. Um, which leads me to the next question about how did you assemble this incredible cast? I mean, you have Tom Holland, you have Eliza Scanlon, you have Mia Wysokowska and, and you know, Riley Q. It's an, inc an incredible ensemble. It was, it was just, a, it, was a, it was a very, at first the, the core cast, the original cast was Rob Pattinson, then Mia Wesikowska and then Tom. And that was the, the cast that we went to market with, with the script. And then, and then Doug Abel came on, who's a really great casting director that I've worked with many times. And he, he came on and we started building lists. And, and the funny thing is that over the years from when I started to, to write the script, to when we started casting it, um, I just kind of had some general meetings with actors along the way. And I got to know these actors without the pressure of like casting them. It was just more like they like my other films and I like their work. And, and it happened, one of those people was Bill Skarsgård, another was Riley Keogh. So it was kind of, part of it was, um, you know, this kind of cast of, uh, people that kind of came through mutual friends or connections, which was Rob, Mia, and Tom, and then, um, and then it was, and then it was um, people that I had met along the way, just for general meetings, and then, and then it was this process of creating lists with my casting director, Doug Abel. Um, did you have the 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 two generations? interact with each other or you know like for example tom holland you know never gets to be with us yeah. yeah i did i did i had i had i had um eliza and mia were talking um they're both australians and they had sort of they were both in sydney at the same time so they had kind of connected there and, and they've subsequently become friends but they were they were kind of like hanging out and developing a friendship while we were in prep and and when we were, you know, on our off hours, when they were on their off hours, the, the thing, specific thing I did with Tom and Bill was that I had, I had Tom, Bill, Riley, and Sebastian Stan um, the two weeks before shooting. And so I got them all together and we didn't do a full read through, but we read through the scenes for, for Riley and Sebastian, it was important to create a, a rapport, a dynamic. So we did some kind of like Meisner kind of exercises to kind of let them play. With Tom and Bill, Tom and Bill never do a scene together, but Bill obviously plays against the younger version of Arvin. So we had the two of them um, read those scenes together. So Tom played nine-year-old Arvin with Bill. And even though, I mean, it's, it, it seems kind of strange, but I, but I think what it did was it gave Tom that memory of doing that with Bill. So mm. when he is in a scene and he's meant to think about this moment in his past that we have in the movie, he doesn't just have to make it up. He can actually go back to a specific moment where he was doing something with Bill and he can kind of like lean into that. So, and they also, the other thing was that they were kind of talking a bit and like kind of 
talking about physicality and if there was little details and things of how they move that would feel inherited. Mm -hmm. That's why, I mean, we were talking about earlier uh, before we went uh, live that um, this movie invites for multiple viewings because things that you basically, when you first see, that you see as throwaways, um, all of a sudden at the end, you realize the impact that you basically planted seeds from the beginning. Yeah. For example, you know, I, I always love um, the scene in the porch with, with, um, with the pie scene. And then, yeah. you, know, it's, you know, it's just a detail that you give us a little seed. And then, yeah. and then two hours later, there, there we are again in that porch with, yeah. with you know it's so so you built that also as well with the relationship with the actors multi-generationally yes yes and the thing about the the movie is it's it's interesting because I, you know if you go into the movie um and you just kind of go along with the ride i think it's one experience but if you're trying to figure out the movie or like do some sort of math in your head about the movie and what it's doing, um, you I feel like you can get stuck in that in that and and miss some of those details and that's why I always think I do think that the second viewing of the movie can be a different experience than the first, but um, but everything is like the movie is just kind of meticulously designed so that everything that that comes back that is referred to in the second half is very carefully layered in throughout the first part of the movie. Um, because what I was interested in was I was interested in those, I was interested in living, like experiencing um, something with this character so that like when he has a memory, we have that memory too. And, wow, yeah. you know, so I, I, that is what I, so like, I, I, I love the idea of, of not just, um, uh, traveling through time with a person, but also spaces. And the prayer log is the best example of that, where it's like the prayer log has a very specific feeling to this little boy. And when we come back to it at the very end, and it looks the way it does, and we're now with the 18 year old version of that boy, there's so much history in it for us as an audience because we lived that with him and we went through so much there, but you, but you didn't realize that you were being set up with something. You know what I mean? Because the, the nature of the movie and the unconventional structure of it, it's not clear that there's a lot of setup and payoff, but it's all there. You know what I mean? And, and so, um, and it's all there so that, so that emotionally when you come back to it in the end, that it really feels like you've lived with this, these people. Correct. I one last question is because I don't want you to miss that that birthday party that oh, is no. happening next door. Um, the spiders, the creepiest moment in the one of the creepiest moments in the movie. Mm -hmm. Um, where was that CGI? Was it real no, spiders? Real. We oh no, that. no. That is real spiders. We spent so much time oh, doing this, this thing because from okay, so from the beginning. This was in the book, and I said, "Look, we gotta, we gotta, we have to do this for real." And when I talked to Harry Melling, I said, "Harry, how do you feel about spiders?" And he knew why I was asking because I was like, "We got, we're doing this for real." But the reality of it, when we started to explore, it was very complicated because you get into a lot of. It's like spiders are very delicate uh, creatures; their legs are very delicate, and you cannot hurt. You cannot hurt any anything on a on a movie set obviously and so um so we had to design a a way of doing this effect a stunt or whatever you want to call it without hurting any of the spiders so we got a an animal wrangler who started to do research we started to devise us a, a, a way of like doing this one shot and then and then um and then it, with with visual effects stitching two shots so basically we do this long shot we get we got the take that we liked we we're like that's it cut freeze frame 
uh, Harry's like this, Harry Melling. And then the CGI people are taking pictures of it all. And then, um, and then we, 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 we then dressed him with a lar like a, a skirt, this big skirt to catch the spiders. And then we, um, we, we brought the bowl of spiders in and then we, and then we go, you know, action. He picks up where he left off and he poured about 40 spiders on his head. And we had found these spiders that were, um, they're orb spiders. They caught them in the wild, this wrangler. We chose them because they were very sturdy and they, they could be in a, in a clump and not, they wouldn't hurt each other. Sometimes spiders, when they get close to each other, start to eat each other. And so, um, yeah, we did this thing. He poured them on his head and then we, we talked about doing another take, but the problem is that the spiders, once they get into a ball, you can't just like pull them apart. You have to wait for them to naturally come apart. Um, and that was going to take like, who, who, who knows how long. So we just kind of, we were like, we got it. We, we, we got it. Um, but that was, that was how that, that all went down. Yeah. Well, thank you for elaborating in such rich detail, but oh. I almost told you five <laughs> times, stop. I don't want to hear this anymore. <laughs> I, I, I had nightmares last night about the scene. Okay. Now I'm going to have more nightmares tonight, thinking about your description okay. of it. Antonio, you're amazing. I could go on talking to you. Oh, um, you Roger. Christine, Christine, your film is so terrific. And, and I encourage everybody to see the, the devil all the time. Thank you so much, Antonio. Thank you, Roger. Have a great, uh, great weekend. Thank you, everybody who came. Ciao.